thanks very much for, for having me. Um, as Beatrix said, I work for Age UK. Um, I used to work at the University of Manchester. I've worked with Beatrix and Lorenzo and Luca and Sabato on various European projects, but um, I escaped academia a couple of years ago. So <laughs> I'm talking from a slightly different perspective, but with reference to, to work that we've, I've done in research as well. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, Age UK, just going to say a little bit about Age UK so you understand um, where I'm talking from, and something about digital engagement in the UK. Then I'm going to talk about some findings from the Far Seeing Project um, and Prevent It, which were European projects. A little bit about policy work in the UK around uh, technologies and digital interventions and then give you some key takeaways um, and I'll share these slides with you after so that you can use them in your in your group work. So um, Age UK is huge it's the largest charity for older people in the UK um, and it's also it's got a federated structure so I work for the national charity uh, but we have 136 network partners across the UK. So I'm also chair of a local charity in West Yorkshire where I live. Um, and to be part of that federation, there's only one thing that everybody does in common, and that's provide information and advice to older people. And we have over 6 million contacts a year with older people uh, giving information and advice. The network partners are all really different beyond information and advice. So ours provides hospital discharge services, foot care, day services, cleaning, shopping. Um, others are bigger than us, others are smaller. They all really vary, but we all do information and advice. Um, so there are a number of national projects as well and, and local projects. So some of what we deliver from Age UK nationally happens across the network. So things like walking football, walking netball. Uh, we're just working with the Lawn Tennis Association at the moment to develop walking tennis. Um, and there are other projects which are really, really hyper-local. And we also have Age International, which is our kind of international arm, supporting and advocating for, for people across the world. Um, we've got quite a lot of work going on at the moment in the Ukraine and Afghanistan, where older people who can't move, couldn't escape, um, are living with quite serious health conditions and, and very limited access to healthcare and medication. So we're quite big. <laughs> Um, I've known about Age UK and I've been involved with them for about 12 years, but when I started working for the national charity, I really had no idea about the breadth um, that they do. So I work in the charity influencing division and I'm in the health influencing team, um, but we also have a, a policy team. So obviously health influencing does what it says on the tin. We cover all aspects to do with health and care, but the policy team do housing, finance, um, basically every aspect of your life, um, we have people who are focused on those areas. We have an engagement and involvement team and a really, really active um, group of older people um, who, some of them are storytellers, so when the media ring and ask us for a story, we've got older people who can talk to the media. Um, we have a sounding board, it's, it's, it's vast really. Um, we have a team of people who work on campaigns and politics, so we're repeatedly the charity that MPs um, in Parliament regard the most highly, uh, so we're really well respected uh, in politics and we do find that people listen to us, which is great. They always do what we say, but you know, <laughs> they do listen. Um, we have a small research team, we commission out quite a lot of research these days, um, and also we have a media team, so I'm frequently asked to, uh, to speak on the radio or on television. I should have been on BBC Breakfast yesterday morning and I was so disappointed to be in Italy instead of on the television. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, we get asked to, to write stuff for newspapers as well. So basically we're just ensuring that older people's voices are heard and advocating for those most in need. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives you an interesting background of Age UK and actually why I was quite happy to jump from academia. <laughs> So I'm going to say a little bit about um, digital access in the UK for older people. So every year Lloyds Bank um, do a consumer digital index and yes they talk about banking and online banking but they also look more broadly at how engaged people are digitally. And the Office for National Statistics, um, their definition of being online is that you've lose, used the internet in the last three months and in last year's um, survey said 99% of the UK population are online, so they've used it in the last three months. But not all engagement is equal. 
found that 27% of those had low digital capacity. So that's 14 million people in the UK of all ages who have low digital capacity. Um, 10.2 million of those lack the digital foundations. So 10 million, sorry, 5 million can't use an app. 4.5 million can't turn on a device uh, or enter login information by themselves. And that overall, there are 5.3 million people who lack both the digital basics and essential digital skills for everyday life. So just because you hear 99% are online, don't assume that they're all confident um, and regular users. And also found that 27% of those who are digitally disadvantaged or underconfident are more likely to have been scammed multiple times. And a case in point is my 88-year-old dad who bought about nine different um, insurance policies for his washing machine, tumble dryer and fridge, uh, spent £1,800 on policies that didn't even exist. So he, he no longer goes online. <laughs> and it, you know, it's an issue. People are frightened of, of being scammed, so it, it does stop them engaging. So, despite 99% being, being online, there are half a million people um, in the UK who are completely <coughs> offline. And that's half of the people aged 75 and over are offline. Um, more than a third of those have never used the internet. Um, I mean, my dad used to use the internet and he doesn't anymore. Um, that's partly be because of the scamming, but also because of cognitive decline. He just can't get his head around it anymore. And things that he used to find easy are just are not easy. They're not straightforward. It's not intuitive to him anymore. So the kind of this idea that eventually when all of us who are 30, 40, 50 um, are going to be digitally engaged, I'd say just be really wary about it because there are always going to be some people who are offline for whatever reason. Um, and 86% of those who um, are offline said it's their personal choice to be offline. They're just not interested. Worried about privacy and security, um, think the internet's too complicated. And increasingly, as, as prices rise for, for everyone across the world, 58% um, want to spend their money on other things and not on data packages and tech. So yeah, 70% could not be enticed to be online, so um, just bear that in mind. <laughs> but for those who could be encouraged to use the internet, the things that are important to them is to stop organisations using their data. They're worried about that, so data security and privacy is important. Um, they want easier to, technologies and um, devices that are easier to understand, um, easy to understand websites and apps with clear navigation, getting support from somebody, uh, not just you know, to, to get online, but to remember between each time how you use the tech. And if things were lower cost, then they think maybe they could be um, encouraged to use the internet. So um, every year we run a huge survey and polling at Age UK. Um, when I first got to Age UK, they said, here you go, Liz, here's the data from the polling, which was um, a 278-tab spreadsheet. Um, and then also, um, is it 75,000 free text responses to a survey? And they said, can you produce it in a couple of months? And I'm, OK. <laughs> so I was a bit rocking in the corner for a while, thinking I can't read every single free text response and get it all out. But um, basically, we have this lovely motto, which is, we do the best that we can in the time that we've got. Um, and, the, and the surveys really help us to tell people's stories and use their voices. So these came from last October. Um, so people saying, you know, making an appointment with my GP surgery seems so complicated now, I don't like to try. Although I can do some stuff online, I can't manage this. So we know some people use Skype or they go on Google, um, but they don't want to do healthcare online or they don't want to uh, do finances online. And the second one, I won't read out the whole lot, but services are too dependent on online tech. I deeply dislike being given a few options to, for making contact and distrust technology. And then this bottom one, I thought it was quite powerful, really. He said, difficult and frustrating procedures to see my GP. I find it really upsetting and stressful that I now have to book blood tests, vaccinations, hospital consultations, etc. myself online. I'm not confident with technology and find the whole process both time-consuming and frustrating. Uh, but maybe with something that's a little bit more user-friendly and a little bit of support, that, that could have been possible. So, far-seeing. Um, ten years ago, <laughs> I can't believe it was ten years ago, we uh, did some research based on 
a systematic review of older people's perceptions of technologies to prevent falls, a stakeholder, stakeholder consultation on technologies, um, some usability testing of three EXA games, which was done in Trondheim at NTNU, uh, some usability testing of a touchscreen interface, um, some focus groups as part of a falls alarm trial, and a technical validation of the smart home technologies which were being developed in Italy. And from all of those different pieces of work that we did in Farseeing, we developed these guidelines for design and implementation of technologies. Um, and hopefully these next three slides are going to be the ones that are going to really help you over the next uh, few days in your groups. So underpinning it all, older people will use technologies if it increases or improves their quality of life. If it doesn't, forget it. <laughs> so there are th three, th three things uh, that were really important. So I've got usability and design, personal motivations, and then also the, the final theme is things for you to bear in mind when you're promoting your technologies. So te as I've said already, must be easy to use, clear interface, clear navigation, um, otherwise people just won't use it. Also, um, the beautiful, beautiful technology that was created by the Italians um, up near Lake Como was a black screen with blue text, which was really fine. It was so stylish, and nobody could read it. <laughs> I think they were devastated that we turned it all off-white with really clear black type. They said, it looks so ugly. <laughs> you do need clear screens. Um, you do need to be able to demonstrate how to use them, not just how to use the, the interface, but how to switch the thing on. <laughs> you know, and, and how to turn it off and, and build that confidence. If you've got wearable tech, it needs to be comfortable. Some of the things that we tried in Farseeing um, had quite thick belts um, for the monitors and they were, they were uncomfortable. People preferred wrist-worn devices. You can think about adapting products that are off, off the shelf, um, which is what we did with the smart home technology. There was something which was designed to make life easy for people, automatically opening your shutters, automatically opening your garage door, we made it more complex, so we made people get up and do those things. Um, but the base was, was already there. They need to be reliable. Um, people will tolerate glitches to a certain extent, but only, only so far. Um, and people need choice and control, so they, were, they wanted to be able to turn things off. And this is in particular with the fall alarms. If a fall alarm was triggered accidentally, they wanted to be able to override that and turn it off. Um, they didn't like flashing lights for things which were on all the time, so they needed to be able to, to choose to turn those things off. And the technology really needed to fit in with their home style and lifestyle, so anything that made it look like a hospital in your living room. <laughs> you know, just because the people, people are older doesn't mean it can't be stylish. Um, so personal motivations. We found that people were really motivated to use technologies if it enabled them to be independent and enabled them to stay living in their own home for longer. In some cases, they were motivated by preventing falls, but as I'm sure a lot of you know, you don't think about a fall until you've had one. So you don't really engage in falls prevention activities generally until you've, it's relevant to you and you've already fallen. But for some people, preventing falls was definitely a motivator. Um, as was safety, so, and also for family members, if, the, if the, their father was using some tech um, which would let them know if he'd fallen or let them know if he'd been sitting too long, then they were kind of given confidence by that because they felt the person was safe. Um, convenience was a, another motivation. Um, don't make somebody's life more complex, really. Um, you know, it, it needs to be convenient to use the technologies. Social benefits are huge. Things like Skype, Zoom, Teams, whatever, they're a real gateway into technology use for older people. But just bear in mind that, you know, again, don't assume that because they're using social tools that they're confident using everything or happy using everything, but it's a good gateway in. Um, increasing confidence is another motivator. So um, with the fall alarms, people were, found, were actually taking more risks because they knew that if they, they fell outside, then somebody would know about it. Um, so actually, yeah, it did enable them to get a little bit more out of their life. For some people, um, they needed to feel challenged, and this was particularly the case with the Exa games. And it, it needed, they needed to have progressive levels and not just be the same all the time because when you stop being challenged, you get bored. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that was good for some people, but not for everybody. 
And then there really has to be a perceived need. If I don't think I need the technology or it's not useful to me for my life, then I'm, I'm not going to use it. So think about these issues when you're, when you're trying to talk to people about technologies. <clears throat> and then finally, from far seeing, there's some things here. Make sure it's affordable, affordable for the older people, but also affordable for commissioners or health systems. You need to really show them the cost benefits um, of those technologies to convince them to invest in it. Appeal directly to older people. Appeal to older people who are curious, because then they will perhaps you know, talk to their peers <clears throat> and, uh, and, and do some of the work for you in terms of promoting the technologies. Use existing networks. If you're in the UK, use Age UK. You know, we're already connected with older people, and then I guess in other countries it'll be the same. You'll have networks <coughs> who, are <coughs> excuse me, who are involved with different user groups. I've got some Beatrix. Thank you. Um, keep it positive. Focus on the benefits. Also, look at what's locally relevant to you. So if you've got in your local health system somebody who's really keen on technology or somebody who needs to reduce the number of home visits, or um, then you know, basically use those people to, to be able to, to show the relevance to the area and how it can help. Use local champions. Show that it's acceptable, so use research where you've got it. Say we've done usability testing as part of this. Um, <clears throat> and also just talk about it wherever it, you can, really. So go to commercial events, write for magazines, write for newspapers where you can. Don't just focus on peer-reviewed research. I worked on Prevent It as well and was uh, responsible for developing the motivational strategy um, for the intervention that used smartphone technology and smartwatches. So we developed um, an app which basically supported people to plan to integrate physical activities into their daily life. Um, so strength and balance act activities, moving more and sitting less into daily life. And the only thing I'm going to focus on here is the uh, technology satisfaction. And I'm not going to go through every number on here, but what I want you to look at is the fact that given the range for each of these, we were pretty much in the middle. So it wasn't brilliant, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't terrible. But it was a feasibility trial, which we used to say about 15 times a day. <laughs> it's a feasibility trial, it's OK. Um, and then also system usability. Um, so the range here in responses was from 25 to 100. Um, and the, so the, the mean was 62 and a half. And actually, from 68 and above is seen as above average. Um, so, again, it, it wasn't great, but it was a feasibility trial. But what we learned from that was to allow plenty of time for technology development and beta testing. In a time-limited project, you're rushing like crazy um, to get everything ready on time, but really make sure you build in that development time. As I said already, participants are tolerant of glitches but wouldn't continue using it if those glitches continued. Some participants needed a lot of technical support, even if they were tech savvy. Um, some liked the technology and the message content and others didn't, so personalise delivery whenever you can. Um, and keep, make sure that you've got iterative development and testing with target groups, because that's absolutely vital. If you present something that you think is going to work for people without involving them, it's probably not going to. Um, so just very briefly, I just want to let you know that in the UK, um, there's a lot of policy work going on at the moment around digital interventions in technology. There's a huge amount of work around digitisation of health and care services, so digital access to appointments, results, follow-up, remote monitoring, um, virtual wards, which are basically delivering hospital care in people's homes. There's also a load of work going on around access to public services and local council services like disabled parking badges. I don't know how the systems work in other countries, but for us, you have to apply for a blue badge. Most of the councils in England make you apply online. Or if they do offer a paper alternative, you have to download it from the website. <laughs> um, so actually, Age UK is doing quite a lot of work at the moment on challenging some of that and saying there needs to be a, a, a good alternative offer and not just put everything online. Um, and then there's work also around financial matters, around online banking. Um, a lot of high street banks are closing, forcing people to be online. Um, and applications for benefits and social security claims are also online. So doing quite a lot of work around that, of making sure it works for older people. 
Um, and I just want to say really briefly, this is a slide about the NHS service and digitisation. <laughs> There's a target for by um, March 2025 that 90% of trusts should have an electronic patient record. You will, ooh, what's going on there? You would kind of hope that everybody already did have an electronic patient record, but they haven't. Yeah, so just to say that it's not just people who are not very digitally savvy, it's also services. So the, all these things are things I've said before. So follow principles of co-design, iterative development, um, provide guidance, support and backup, focus on increasing confidence and independence, keep it simple, uh, focus on reliability and find a champion or an early adopter to help you. Uh, don't assume use of one technology means they're proficient in all of them. Uh, connecting with others can be a motivator and a gateway to broader technology use, but maybe not necessarily. Focus on the benefits. You know, appreciate that some people will never use digital technologies, and also some people, like my dad, will lose those digital skills. Be aware of your policy context, nationally and locally, and for goodness sake, talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am here all week. Um, so if you've got any questions, you can ask now or later. <laughs>